that it is National Interpreters Appreciation Day today. And so we wanted to take this opportunity. It, we, we always thank our interpreters uh, for being with us to push out the message related to COVID-19. Um, but today we want to do a special celebration of the interpreters and a special recognition. So I have an official proclamation. I will not be reading the whole thing, but I am going to read two paragraphs um, in honor of our interpreters. So it's a proclamation recognizing National Interpreters Appreciation Day. And it says, whereas American Sign Language interpreters are essential to accommodate the information needs of deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing populations, and whereas American Sign Language interpreters, specifically Jay Gates, Vicki Emerson, and Tim Hodges, and we had a woman named Sarah here with us a while back as well, provide vital information at Hamilton County press conferences and open meetings to thousands of Hamilton County residents who identify as deaf, deafblind, or hard of hearing while educating and informing the hearing public about communication equity and accommodation. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners does hereby proclaim this fifth day of May 2021 as National Interpreters Appreciation Day in all of Hamilton County. Applause, applause for the interpreters. We always, that's the applause line, everyone. So Vicki is gonna come up and accept the resolution. And I am so grateful to you. So, so grateful. Thank you. Say thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, now we'll get down to business. Thought it was important to do some recognition here. All right. While the news has been positive lately, first vaccinations are going up. We're at 42% of the population in Hamilton County today. We do want to tell the cautionary tale that the COVID virus is still among us and we're not out of the woods. So we'll get to the numbers. So the total folks that have had COVID-19 in Hamilton County is 79,661. The number of people hospitalized in Hamilton County is up to 3,062. And the number of people that have died in Hamilton County from COVID-19 is up to 1,200. 1,200. Ah. So second vaccination shots are among us, but they're slowing down. We're here today to encourage everyone to get their vaccine to help us fully reopen again. And here are some key points. It's easy to get the shot and the time is now. There are lots of appointments available. There is probably a provider near your home. We know there's a provider near your home within 10 minutes of your home. Long gone are the days when you had to fight for the appointment or wait in long lines. If you have been waiting until the vaccine was more abundant to get your shot, now is the time. I am gonna read through a list of some of the locations that are open uh, and delivering vaccine, many of which are walk-ups. You don't even need to have an appointment anymore. I'm not gonna read through all of them because it is National Interpreters Day and I think that would be grueling. So <laughs> we're just gonna go through some of them and I'm gonna read them fairly slowly. But some of the ones I'm reading are being set up by providers throughout the county Greg Kesterman, the County Health Commissioner, is gonna read through some of the sites that are available through Hamilton County Public Health. So just to give you a flavor of what's going out in that community, and it's four pages long, by the way. Um, so some of these are from Cincinnati Public Health. They're at New Vision Church on Reading Road, the Price Hill Library, the Hartwell Rec Center. They're on Glen Crossing at an urgent care they're uh, down at Finley Market. They're at a Presbyterian church in Winton Terrace. We've got a location down in the West End at Seven Hills Neighborhood Houses. The African American Chamber up on Gilbert. Gives you an idea, they're all over the place. And then we have the hospitals. In addition to that, we've got Children's Hospital up on Burnett. UCMC in Clifton, 
Christ Hospital. The healthcare connection is in Lincoln Heights in Mount Healthy. Mercy is in Bond Hill, Anderson, Kenwood, Amberley Village, and Tri Health is out in Montfort Heights. So, as you can see, there is a multitude of locations where you can get a vaccine and get it quickly. The time is now. So research shows that many people who are hesitating state that they are concerned about the short amount of time in which the vaccine was developed and approved and potential side effects or interactions regarding the vaccine. But with so many Americans already vaccinated, we know that this vaccine is safe and effective. We know that it's saving lives. The numbers prove that out. However, it's perfectly reasonable to have questions. The medical professionals at vaccine clinics are happy to answer your questions. You can also call your own doctor. I, in fact, ran into a nurse at one of the clinics I visited, and she said someone came in, was just unsure about the vaccine, asked her a lot of questions, left that day, needed to process, came back the next day and got a vaccine. That, that's fine, that's great. Also, people have been waiting until the most vulnerable got vaccinated, kind of waiting their turn. Greg has a chart that he's gonna to share today that shows a large population of those that are most vulnerable, those that are 65 and above, have gotten their vaccine. So again, now is the time for everybody to go get the vaccine. And some folks have been hesitating because it was too complicated um, or too time consuming to make the appointment and get to the location. Again, no longer the case. We've got walk-up clinics now. So please, um, now's the time to get the vaccine. So before we move on to Greg, um, Hamilton County Health Commissioner, uh, we also have Willie Cunningham today, um, the great American from WLW, who will uh, be talking about his experience getting the vaccine. But very quickly, let me give you an update related to the American Rescue Plan. Um, and I'm gonna put this in brief. So um, as you know, the money coming to the county, we're gonna get a direct allocation as we did last time. And the guidance from Treasury is all coming to us on May 10th. So at that point, we will have a much better understanding of what is allowed uh, by way of how we uh, allocate these dollars. And so internally, we've done two focus groups um, amongst the county administration. We've also now had two external focus groups with um, stakeholders in the community. It's a wide variety of stakeholders. And so we've gotten that input as to what are the emergent needs still unmet and what are the transformational things we can do with these dollars as we look forward for the next couple of years. And so that's kind of the calculation that's going on here at the county. Um, we are also gonna hold some public hearings to hear from the larger public, and those will likely be at the end of May. So we'll keep updating, but we'll look forward to that and hearing from folks as to what they view as the needs right now and the long-term hopes uh, for these dollars, including things like housing, mental health, um, there, there are some real issues that we need to tackle in the community, and um, some of these dollars could be used for that, all of which were exacerbated by COVID-19. We're also meeting with the city to make sure that we can collaborate and um, coordinate our efforts with one another. Um, we also have some federal programs coming online, uh, broadband band assistance for one, um, and restaurant help for two. If you need information related to those, go to 513 Relief. That's our website, and all of it is explained there, and you can apply via that website. So please look to that for things that are currently available, uh, primarily through the federal government. This is before we get our, our allocation, but there, there's money available right now. All right, so with that, uh, we are gonna turn to Greg Kesterman for the update from Hamilton County Public Health. Good morning. I'm uh, continued to be pleased with the number of folks in Hamilton County that are getting vaccinated. 
This is the number one tool that we have available right now to end this pandemic in Hamilton County. <clears throat> As Commissioner Driehaus just indicated, more than 340,000 people in Hamilton County have been vaccinated, which is huge, and we're excited to see that continue to grow week after week. Turning to the data first, as I normally do, December 10th was our highest day or week on record. We had 716 cases per day. Over the last seven days, we finally have dropped below 100. We are actually at 81 cases per day, so that's very hopeful. I'm uh, very optimistic that we'll continue to see some decreasing in our average cases. As you've heard me say many times, this is tied to the Ohio alert system. So if you were to look at the state's alert system, we are red with high incidence. If we're able to get over a 14 week period, that number below 100 will finally be able to transition to orange. So that's exciting news. Uh, there remains still a lot of COVID in our community. There are about 2,900 active cases of COVID in Hamilton County right now. So we still need folks to be cautious, particularly those who have not been vaccinated. We know COVID is more likely to spread in indoor environments when people let their guard down. So please continue to be careful as you're out and about. In addition, on this slide, I share the number of variants within Hamilton County. We have mostly seen just the UK variant. Overall, we have about 47 variants. It does take about two weeks for a variant to come back from the lab as, as positive. And so I suspect this number is much higher, but the good news once again is the vaccine is effective against variants. So if you're concerned about the variants and you have questions, get vaccinated, now is the time. Looking at our region's uh, reproductive number, the region is at 0 0.94, Hamilton County is at 0 0.89, as mentioned, our cases are coming down, so that reproductive number will slip down slowly as we see this decrease in cases. If we see cases start to level off, say around 80, then we'll see that number kind of creep back up closer and hang out around one again. Moving over to our hospital systems, in our 14 county hospitals, we have 142 patients within the hospital systems, 36 individuals in the intensive care unit, and uh, I think the most important thing to gain from this when talking with physicians is that pretty much none of these individuals have received their vaccinations. So we know the number one way to stay out of the hospital is by getting vaccinated. It is a super important tool if you're trying to make sure that you stay healthy in the coming weeks, get vaccinated because it keeps you out of the hospital. Switching over to vaccines, Commissioner Driehaus referenced um, the age groups that uh, have been vaccinated. Overall in Hamilton County, as mentioned, nearly 42% of all residents have been vaccinated, translating to about 340,000 residents. We have seen a slowdown in the rate that our appointments are filling, but we are still seeing uptake week after week from all age groups in our vaccination efforts. The graph on the left left represents those in the younger age groups. You can see week after week, we are seeing increases in the number of each of these age groups taking on the vaccine. I think it's important to point out, I have had a lot of questions about the youngest age demographic that's eligible for vaccine. The data on the graph includes those that are zero to 15, which are not currently eligible to be vaccinated. So if you were to remove those, you would see a much sharper increase in the rate that those individuals are getting vaccinated. The graph on the right represents those that are over 65. And as you can see, some are already over 80% vaccinated, some of the population. And each of these groups is getting closer to 80%. We have made a ton of progress. And if you've been waiting to make sure that those that need the vaccine the most have had it, at this point in time, they have. I really want to just continue to encourage folks to get vaccinated. The other item that I just want to continue to stress is that we are continuing to make it easier to get vaccinated within our community. There are many, many partners in Hamilton County that are doing this work. This coming week, Hamilton County Public Health will be partnering with the Ohio Department of Health. They will be bringing a mobile unit to Hamilton County and will be vaccinating at many locations across the county. We have a six day schedule and we'll be hopping around and uh, making sure that we are accessible. We'll be using uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine at these sites initially. And if we find that folks would prefer the Pfizer, we will adjust like we have done throughout this vaccination campaign. 
we want to be as flexible as possible to make people comfortable when we are vaccinated. The second slide I have on vaccinations is from testandprotectcincy.com. On their website, there's probably 30 locations throughout Hamilton County where you can walk up and get tested. New this week, if you want to go grocery shopping and get vaccinated without an appointment, Kroger's will be vaccinating you. So there are so many opportunities throughout Hamilton County. I just really encourage folks to take advantage of these opportunities. So in closing, if, if you want to get vaccinated, you've had difficulty doing so, right now it's easy and it's painless and it's quick and we know it's safe. I shared earlier that vaccinations are the number one tool at keeping folks out of the hospital. If you've been hesitant, I think this is the one statistic that really drives home the importance of getting vaccinated and how safe it is to get vaccinated. Thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Um, just to elaborate a little bit about the distribution of the vaccine, the governor has stated that he is also making sure that private physicians uh, have access to the vaccine because some people, who, they trust their physician and they want to get the vaccine through the physician. So that is also happening, in addition to all the pharmacies that, that Greg just referred to. So thank you for that update. Um, so now we're going to turn to our special guest, Willie Cunningham. Um, Willie, we're going to um, ask you to talk about how you got vaccinated, why it was important to you that you did that. And then because I'd like to turn the tables, I'm going to ask you a question about something. Uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. So, uh, Willie, are you there? I think I'm here. Can you hear me and can you see me? We can see and hear you. Good. I don't know if that's good or bad. Uh, uh, well, you know what they say about radio voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, when, when I look at this thing in uh, February, March, April, May of last year, I, I think there was a little bit of doubt among some, me included, that this thing was going to be similar to 1918 or 1919. When you're on radio for about 18 to 20 hours a week, you have all the guests on. There's all kind of conspiracy theories. And sometime in September, October, November is when I said uh, to Penny, to myself, I said, this might be the one that we see in the movies and that documentaries have been done about. And so I took the next several months. And what I did was speak to some medical professionals that I respect. Uh, I think there's three groups of Americans generally that are reluctant today. Here we are in, in first part of May to get vaccinated. Number one is men. We men, for some reason, don't want to go see a doctor. Denise, I think a lot of women do. I don't want to be sexist, which I am all the time. But, but I'll say this. I think, in essence, I, I'm resistant to going to a doctor. And so if you can have a Hamilton County program that talks to men, uh, I talked to Stephen Reese about this and some others who are simply are resistant to go see a doctor. The second group are those that, uh, shall we say, are disconnected. There's large numbers of Americans living in Hamilton County, maybe 10 or 20 percent, that sadly don't listen to radio. They don't watch television. They don't read the inquiry. They're not watching you, Greg, me. They're not watching anyone right now. That 10 to 20 percent are disconnected and that isn't a good or a bad thing it's a it's factual and so by having the mobile vans going into the community maybe setting up at the holy grail going to a, outside of a kroger store maybe go to a, a festival or an event outside of a mass on the west side and say here we are that would help and there's a third group the anti-vaxxers some of whom i put on the air and many i do not who simply believe it's a government conspiracy that somehow the dna the messenger rna is being manipulated and somehow that'll be turned on at some point and all of us become zombies. And so those are the three categories that have to be uh, looked at. When I made the decision in December uh, to get vaccinated, I, I didn't rely upon the, uh, uh, my guest. I didn't rely upon Segman Dennison. I didn't rely upon other experts. What I did was call my doctor and I spoke to my pharmacist. I went to Dr. Dean Kariakis at the Christ Hospital. I have some other docs that I'm close to like Timothy Kremchak. And each of them said, Willie, get it done. So if I'm going to get my car fixed, I'm not going to overrule the mechanic. When I go see my accountant, my accountant says, you have to do this. I'm not going to say, you know, Al Recito, you're wrong. I'm not going to do that. Each of us have to rely upon experts. And so as a man who is naturally resistant to the vaccine, who heard all the conspiracy theories, I relied upon medical advice. And I went to see my pharmacist at Adrian Pharmacy, Wayne Morris, and said, Wayne, he didn't give me any names, of course. He said, I can't tell you the number of people who have coming in here that are in deep trouble. I think about our mutual friend, Pat Berry. 
who uh, contracted COVID-19. He had some underlying conditions as all of us have. And Pat Berry went through two to three weeks of a living hell with a ventilator stuck down his throat, dying in a horrible fashion. And from that experience, I tell everyone that I can, that when you live in the 21st century, take advantage of the things that make your life uh, longer and more healthy. So I relied upon medical advice. I went to a pharmacist that I trusted and I got in line really in December and January in Naples, Florida, that there were testing sites that Ron DeSantis set up in which at a public store that had 500 vaccines. Uh, my wife and I said, why don't we go there about uh, seven or eight o'clock in the morning? It was gonna open at nine o'clock. And at, in actuality, over 5,000 cars were lined up from the day before. And mainly the, the folks in Florida were, shall I say, of uh, Jim Scott's age. They, they were older people and they were begging to get it. I can't imagine now here we are in May and now you walk up to a Kroger store with Rodney McMullen, the CEO in charge, and you can simply go and buy your fruit and your berry and, and get, some, uh, get some hamburger and get a shot. And so from my perspective, I was doubtful. I was St. Thomas. I did not believe for the first five or six months. I thought it might've been a government conspiracy theory. I thought this isn't the big one. We've gone through so many of these in the past. We went through SARS, we went through Ebola. We went through 1957, we went through 1968, we went through all the other stuff. And I did not believe until the fall when so many of friends that I had and associates had contracted it. So I would urge all great Americans to get the vaccine, even if you're a man, even if you're disconnected, uh, even if you don't believe, get this shot because long term, you want to stay here as long as possible. So that's kind of my story. I relied upon medical advice. And secondly, a pharmacist who told me to get her done. And Denise, I got her done. Yeah, I'm glad. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. Let me ask you a quick question. So how did you do? Uh, and how far out are you from the vaccine? I got my second shot. That was a Pfizer around February the 20th. Uh, the people's judge, my wife, got it with me. And to be honest, uh, she went through two days of a terrible flu-like symptom. It got so bad on the second day, I called uh, Dr. David Fisher of the Christ Hospital. He said, just stick with it. And within 12 hours after that, she got fine. So don't go into this thing thinking it's like nothing. It is something. There's about five to 10% of us have a reaction. And so the reaction in her case was bad. In my case, it was, uh, it was perfect and it didn't have any impact at all. And I feel free now not to wear a mask in many circumstances. I'm not wearing one now. Most people in our newsroom do not wear a mask because after all, all of us have now been vaccinated. And, and I pay attention to people like Jack Crumley, who, who Crumley, despite the fact that he's got the vaccine, he's still wearing a damn mask, which I don't understand, to make some silly political statement. But nonetheless, most of us, uh, once you get the mask, you're in good shape, can proceed with life. And that's the way it, there ought to be a benefit to getting the shot, which is you return to normal. I look forward to the day when we go to the great American ballpark, we can go out and do things socially and otherwise with children and do things to get back to normal life. Americans must act like Americans as proud stallions in the high ranges of Wyoming, scratching at a pale blue sky. We got to get back to work. We got to get back to life. Well, Willie, without you, we would have not had that vision. So thank you for that. Um, and, and, you know, it, it reminds me that we should thank all of the people that have gotten vaccinated because they are the ones that are they've allowed us to start to open back up. So especially the older folks who uh, have done their part. So th thanks again for reiterating that. Um, I just wanna uh, riff off a, one thing you said as far as people that are disconnected. So public health is trying to reach out to those communities. Some, you know, uh, we went to a, uh, manufactured home facility uh, to just that population uh, that is, is not hearing the message otherwise. Went in, set up tents, got them vaccinated, went out to Kenwood Mall, uh, went to a movie theater, got some of those. We tried Paul Brown Stadium with the city, uh, heading that one up, tried that one. So we are trying different things to make sure that we're hitting it on all fronts. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, so with that, we're going to go to questions, Bridget. Thank you, Commissioner. Up first, Ann Sanker with the Inquirer has questions for Greg and Bill Cunningham. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for, uh, for doing this. Uh, Greg, I wonder if you could circle back to Mr. Cunningham's point about masking after vaccination and even after full immunization, because uh, there does seem to be a lot of confusion about indoors, outdoors, groups, and you know, uh, I wonder if you could, if there's some guidance here that you could provide for us. 
Perfect. Thanks for the question. You know, generally speaking, public health has followed the Centers for Disease Control guidance and recommendations. They have a wonderful chart on their website that breaks down which situations for folks that have been vaccinated and for those that haven't been vaccinated. Uh, at this point, I've been vaccinated. When I am outside, the CDC says I don't have to wear a mask unless I'm in a really crowded situation. And so when I'm outside, I don't wear a mask and it's safe and it's it's perfectly acceptable to not wear a mask if you're outside and vaccinated. The CDC has also said to, to Willie's point, if you're in a room with fully vaccinated people, it's safe to not wear a mask. And so, you know, as we get these freedoms back, I think we should take advantage of, of, of the science that has gotten us to this point, the science that has showed us that we have a safe and effective vaccine. And this is the path to ending this pandemic. All right, thank you very much, Greg. Um, Mr. Cunningham, thank you very much for coming on uh, with us today. I wonder if you could, I'm kind of curious to know if you've had any further deeper thoughts about how you were discussing the pandemic in the early stages and how you're discussing it now. Do you have, I mean, you, your, your business is throwing open your mic to people who want to talk about this from all perspectives, but it was cl it's clear that some caused harm. And I wondered if you thought about that in, in, as part of your work in radio. What, what I do in talk radio, which is different than the Inquirer and different than television, is act as a sounding board for different opinions. And uh, the general thrust, you might recall that President Trump was in office in February, March, April, May, and June. And I have tended to be and still believe in the principles of Donald Trump, not so much his personality, not so much as tweeting, but as, as, as principles. And so when a person politically that you respect says certain things repeatedly, and Dr. Anthony Fauci has given many interviews after uh, January and February, and Fauci said that there were few things, if any, he could come to mind that he did not say publicly that uh, did not happen. And so I know Fauci and other members of the CDC said at the time it became extremely political. In fact, even today, I. I think many people wear a mask in situations where they don't need to wear one to make a political statement. So uh, I don't, you know, what I do is a sounding board. And so February, March, April, May, June, I had on the president, I had on representatives of the CDC, I had on others. And, and at that point in February, March, April, and May, the president and others said, President Trump said, that this thing's gonna, all gonna go away by the summertime. And you might recall last summer, the charts kind of went down significantly until September, October, and November, when things came back with a with a rush, it, it was ugly in uh, November, December, January, and it was high January, February were bad months, and now it's gone back the other way. And it's gone that way because more the vaccine became available. I can imagine where we would be right now in May if we did not have the vaccine from Pfizer, Moderna, and from J and J. Where would we be now? It would be similar to what happened in 1918 and 1919 with much higher numbers. And so, uh, as far as Putting on guests, uh, I reflect many times what people are thinking. Callers call in, much like yourself or others. Uh, Jason Williams, the editor of the Inquirer I have on now, and Burl does a great job. And we reflect what the community says. And I want all voices to be heard. And at some point, I have my own opinion. But I want a different set of voices. Now, many times in life, there aren't different voices. For example, if someone has a broken leg, there's not a different set of voices whether the leg is broken or not. But that was not the situation a year ago, maybe nine, 10 months ago with medical experts. I had on some medical experts who said this thing would go away and it didn't go away. So we reflect what's happening. But as far as taking responsibility or something like that, I, uh, I'm a talk show host. I'm not, I'm not with the CDC. I'm watching this morning, Dr. Walensky was on one of the talk shows this morning and she was asked whether a child who's six years old playing soccer uh, now, it might be 80 degrees in Texas or Florida, and whether a child who has a very low risk of a bad result, under 0.1% for a child, whether that child who's playing soccer in the heat should be wearing a mask. And Dr. Walensky said, yes, it's better to wear a mask. I think when those things are out there, it kind of communicates the idea that I think most parents would not accept that as reasonable behavior because a child is not at risk, generally speaking. And secondly, uh, many times not breathing properly, could have other respiratory uh, involvement, such as the high school girl who ran that track meet, and when she got near the end wearing a mask, she collapsed and had some other medical event. So it's a teeter-totter. But 
Uh, in talk radio, we're not the inquire. We're not television. We have different opinions expressed by different individuals. And then the listener can determine which opinions are worthy of belief and which are not. Was Pat Berry's death a real turning point for you? Well, by that point, I'd already been vaccinated. But I got updates on Pat Berry from Dennis Jansen every day. And every time I read what was going on with the ventilator, when a ventilator is in, as you may know, for like three weeks, most of the time there's not a good result. Pat worked here. We loved Pat. He did more things in media, television, radio, maybe anybody in the history of this business. Right. So, my, but, my, but my question to you, Bill, is what is the moment for you where you went from being someone who was highly skeptical of what was happening in this environment to someone who is now a pretty strong advocate for vaccination. I'm just trying to figure out what, what was the moment for you? Do you have a clarity on that? The evidence. Uh, October, yeah, a moment, a moment, like was, a moment that happened. Moment, when the chart, when, when the graphs went so high and the infection rate got out of control, community spread, it wasn't from community spread person to person, became great. October, November, December, it was an evolution. There wasn't some moment. By the time Pat Barry went through a living hell, which is what he went through, I think most of us in the media had already had said, at least on our side of the fence, that, uh, okay, we, that we have to get the vaccination. For many months, there was a strong sense uh, the last, uh, for the first six to eight months of this thing, the coronavirus would go away, it would evaporate, and uh, medical community wasn't exactly saying that but political leaders were. And one last point I, I, I would make on that is that today, a lot of men on my side of the political fence don't want to hear from Dr. Anthony Fauci. We don't want to hear from Joe Biden. We don't want to hear from Kamala Harris. We don't want to hear when, when individuals who, with my political philosophy, hear from them, we react differently, much as those who, when Donald Trump would tell a Democrat to do something, Donald Trump, do this, Democrats viscerally would say, I'm not doing it. And so today, the opposite is true. I think there's a hardening of the 30 to 40 percent of Republican men that do not want to get vaccinated. Number one, men are men and generally don't go to doctors as much. Number two, when you have Dr. Anthony Fauci and Joe Biden say, get vaccinated, there's a visceral reaction to oppose. And so I think different voices need to come out because that's been tried now for the last 103 days. And so if to reach 30 to 40 percent of Republican men, conservative men, I would not use those voices. I would use other voices to say, get vaccinated. One of those little voices is mine to get vaccinated. I, I don't pay much attention to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris any more than Democrats paid attention to, to, to Donald Trump. If Donald Trump told you to do something, you say, hey, I'm going to do that. No. And likely today when I see Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, uh, Nancy Pelosi wearing those silly masks in situations they shouldn't be wearing them, people like me say, I'm not doing that. It's a political statement on the opposite side of wearing a mask in a situation not required. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I just, I'm, I find this curious, Bill, because your station holds an FCC license, unlike the Inquirer or other news organizations. So I just wonder if that, if that colored how you thought about this at all, that you had a responsibility going into this. And I realize you were on a certain side of the political spectrum, but do you think that contributed to where we are now? I think the FCC has no role in deciding which political opinions are expressed and which are not expressed. Uh, I, one might say that uh, Democrats who advocate uh, abortion practices should be dealing with the FCC also, but I, I think the FCC should not be involved in decisions about liking or not liking. Okay, I, I was simply saying that you help. Well, anyway, I'm going to defer the questions. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Cunningham. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Todd Dykes from WLWT News 5, and he has questions yeah, hello. for Greg. Yeah, hello, everyone. Okay. Sorry. Um, Greg, let's talk a bit about what Bill had mentioned, um, going to a, a Catholic church, for example, being in the parking lot regarding the vaccine push. I'm curious, meeting people where they are, you know, the, we know that some bars and restaurants seem to have been places where people, I mean, I don't know all the details. I can't recall specifically, but what does that look like? What if there were a proprietor out there that wanted to have a vaccine clinic of sorts, or even just like a person there that could give a vaccine? Obviously cold storage would be problematic, I guess, but what does that look like? Are you thinking outside the box on, on, on that front and what could we expect on down the road? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking the question. Um, we are welcoming any suggestions for vaccine clinics at this time. If we have a form on our website you can fill out. If you can't find the form, just go to our comments section and, and suggest it. If you have a club, a bar, we have been doing vaccines at, at different types of locations. We've been in contact with a brewery and are exploring uh, vaccinations at the brewery. We are open to, to vaccinating wherever um, we are wanted to, uh, and are excited for that opportunity. Thank you. Next up, we have Miana Massey hey, from Bridget, can I add to that a little bit? We're also reaching out to businesses. Um, I've been making calls to local chambers of commerce, including the Cincinnati Regional Chamber, but also all those local chambers that are outside the city um, and gotten pretty re res good responses from some of these bar businesses that either collectively want Greg to set up a tent in the parking lot so they can have their employees get vaccinated or a company that's larger that can have employees and their families come and get vaccinated. So we, Greg has given us information. We're pushing it out to these chambers, to elected officials in these areas, trying to encourage them to give us their ideas because Greg and his team are happy to go anywhere as long as there are folks there that want to get vaccinated. Thank you, Commissioner. Miana Massey with WLWT News 5. She has questions. You're muted. I am muted. Um, I have some questions for Comm Commissioner Kesterman, um, just about kind of planning ahead to this um, emergency authorization for those Pfizer and that 12 plus. So how does that change the game for Hamilton County and I guess the country as a whole? You know, I think the more folks that are eligible to be vaccinated, the sooner we will reach thresholds that are necessary for herd immunity. We have already been in communication with several of our schools in Hamilton County that want to run vaccination clinics for those that are 12 and older. Um, we continue to do vaccination work for those that are 16 and older in school environments. Depending on when that authorization comes, some of the schools may already be out of session. We will continue to hold Pfizer clinics at various locations around the county to make sure that it's accessible. And if there are kids that haven't been vaccinated when school starts back up, public health and many other partners will still be there to make sure that they have access. And so I know you guys talked a little bit about um, just reaching those communities that are a little more hesitant. I know you're saying that you're going to open more clinics, but if the people don't want to get the vaccine, what is some other strategies that we're using besides just, you know, making it more accessible? So, you know, early on, uh, one of the strategies was to set up large scale clinics around the county. You've heard about the Cintas Center being a mass vaccination site. And we were actually filling several thousand appointments in a couple day period with no issue. As we moved past that threshold of having some more supply, we now know that we have to have smaller clinics in more convenient locations. And so that's some of what we've talked about today. Uh, my team has set up at a manufactured home park. My team set up alongside of a busy road and had a sign and no appointments necessary. We're really trying to get creative to make sure that folks have access to vaccine when they're ready to take it. Uh, you know, we heard Willie talk about the, the moment in time when he started thinking about getting vaccinated. I realize not everyone is ready at this moment in time, and it does sometimes take some education and some, some information, whether it's from a doctor or a pharmacist, and we want to be there ready to vaccinate if, if you've made that choice. And so I've um, actually talked to someone who said they were all for getting the vaccine, but for their child, they were a little more hesitant. What message do you have to, to parents, and how is that messaging changing from a grown adult to a young 12-year-old? The same safety standards that went into place to get all three vaccines into place in the United States have come into play again when they're testing the Pfizer vaccine out for the 12 to 15 year olds. So it's important to know that the vaccine is safe for even those younger age groups. And eventually we'll find that the vaccine is available for even younger individuals. That said, parents need to check with their physician and those that they trust and make the decision on their own. We know that this vaccine saves lives. We know that this vaccine keeps people out of the hospital. And even though children, generally speaking, do not get the most significant illness and often do not die from COVID, there are instances where that happens. So I'd, I'd ask parents to take the vaccine serious, to think about it, and to make sure that you're making a decision that you're comfortable with. Commissioner Driehaus mentioned shortly ago that we are also working with the state to get many more pediatricians and private providers as vaccination sites. There is no more trusted spot for me to take my child than my own pediatrician. So we're working many different strategies to try and make sure that parents have safe access to vaccine for their children. 
Perfect. And then one just last question. I know Biden set a date for 70 percent of all adults by July 4th. And I think you were telling me um, a couple of weeks ago that Hamilton County's date is um, you're aiming for June. Um, are we still expecting to hit that majority deadline, even with some of these slower groups that are a little more hesitant to get it? I believe our region set the goal of 80 percent by July 1. It's a very optimistic and very difficult goal. But if we don't set the bar high, then then we won't be able to move move to where we need to get. We are going to continue to make every effort to make vaccine available. And uh, right now, I think we're at 47 percent of our total population when you remove those under the age of 16. Perfect. Thank you so much. Can I ask a question to Greg Kesterman? Hey, Nick, will, so I just asked Greg a question as well. So we do have a demographic that's over 80. Yes, those between 70 years and 80 or 70 years and 79 year olds are already over 80 percent and several individual or several of the age groups over 65 are very, very close to 80 percent already. Sorry, Will. Can, I ask, Can I ask, uh, great question, uh, assuming we have 430,000 or so vaccinated and assuming there's about 70,000 that have tested positive, that's about a half million in Hamilton County and assuming that twice that number of 70,000 have had COVID-19, but have not been tested to prove it, which is the number generally accepted. We're close to 600,000 either vaccinated or have COVID-19 uh, already. We have about 650,000 adults in Hamilton County. So it looks to me as if, if we have 600,000 vaccinated or infected, got the T cells, that's 600,000. And we got 650,000 adults and the other 200,000 tend to be children. Aren't we already at herd immunity with those over the age of 16? So I would challenge that, and I can see your point, but I would always fall back on science in the Centers for Disease Control as our national leader with information and the study of COVID. This is a brand new pandemic. We've never lived through anything like it. As you said early on, early it might not have looked like it was going to be that bad, and then we saw hospitalizations and deaths fly through the roof. Where we are at today is we're still learning about how long someone who is infected with COVID remains able to be in the community without easily reacquiring the disease. We're also still learning about the vaccine and how long it lasts and how long it will continue to last. Many of the Ill illnesses that you referenced happened early on in the pandemic, as early as February of 2020. And so are those individuals that received COVID early on, are they still protected today? Are they still part of the solution? I don't know, and that is actively being studied. Same, same answer with the vaccine. We are actively studying and learning as we go with the vaccine. There's actually a vaccine reporting system. It's called VAERS. And anyone who has a negative event with vaccine reports so that we can continue to have better science around the vaccines. In addition, our hospital systems are required to report when they have somebody show up that's been fully vaccinated. You heard me earlier today say that 142 people are within our hospital systems with COVID and pretty much none of them have had the full vaccine regimen. So we know the vaccine works and because we're studying it, we are learning more and more each day. I think that as the CDC gets more data, we will see a world more like you described. We will see a world where people are not encouraged to wear masks in many more situations. The CDC though does not want us to go backwards they are being very cautious with the science. Now, to many, it's not fast enough. To many, this vaccine is kind of like the, the end end line. We've, we've passed the finish line, I'm safe. But the CDC does not want us to see a higher death count, a higher hospitalization rate. So they're being cautious and they're doing so with protection in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Todd Dykes from WLWT has one more question for Mr. Cunningham. Yeah, Bill, um, appreciate the perspective today and, and broadcasting to your listeners. Given your political views, I am curious to hear what you think about. I'm seeing more reporting around the idea of incentivizing um, people to get the vaccine, whether that's a $10 gift card to a local shop or something. Um, what, you know, those who've been vaccinated might take umbrage with that, but in an effort to get more people vaccinated, is that something that you are in favor of or just out of curiosity, what do you think about those conversations? We often pay people to do the right thing. And if it takes $10, so be it. I don't think for those, according to polling, 30 to 40% of conservative men don't want the vaccine. And I don't think if your health is involved and there's a thought that you're gonna catch something worse or in two or three years, we're gonna find out like thalidomide, which was a great thing for pregnant women. Then later on, it turned out not to be so, that $10 will make any difference 
to, to people like uh, Seg Mandenison. Uh, he likes free stuff, but let's face it, I don't think 10 bucks will coerce someone who's opposed. I get calls every day. I'm never getting the thing. Pfizer has no immunity whatsoever from prosecution. This is not proven safe and effective by the FDA, which is factually accurate. It's on emergency use basis only. I anticipate it will be done, but to tell somebody whose health is at risk and their opinion by getting the vaccine, we're gonna give you a latte, I don't think that would work. Okay, that seems to conclude our questions from reporters. Well, thank you as always to Greg Kesterman, Health Commissioner, for being here. And thank you, Willie Cunningham, for being here um, talking about some of the challenges that exist in this community as far as getting folks vaccines. So uh, thank you for helping spread the word that the time is now to go get your vaccine. I don't care who you are. Um, I don't care what demographic you fall in. The time is now. So thanks again. And thank you uh, to Vicki and Tim for interpreting. Is that it?